Today on How to Drink, we are talking about the world's most famous drinks. We're talking about water, milk, coffee, tea, probably orange juice. No, actually, it's going to be cocktails. We're talking about cocktails. <laughs> All right, well, you might notice that I have this cup of tea, Earl Grey, hot, as enjoyed numerous times by Captain Jean-Luc Picard and as instructed to his replicator. A lot of drinks have been made famous throughout the years from movies and TV and just by being enjoyed by famous persons. This is not going to be an exhaustive list, but we grabbed a few. We're going to throw them together here today in a drinks of fabulousness, drinks of the wildly famous. Drinks of Great Renown. Now that's what I call Drinks Volume 7. I think probably <laughs> few drinks are more famous than the Vesper Martini. Although it's funny to me because like growing up, unless you read the James Bond novels, and I didn't, James Bond wasn't specifically associated with the Vesper. It was gin martini, shaken, not stirred. That was the James Bond line. But it wasn't until Casino Royale came out and Bond fans were reintroduced to that one. Dry martini. Oui, monsieur. Wait. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Lille, shake it over rice, and then add a thin slice of lemon peel. It's a weird drink. Three ounces of London Dry Gin, it's an ounce of vodka, it's a half an ounce of Kina Lille in the book, but Lille stopped making Kina Lille a long time ago. These days, you've got three options. You can do Lille Blanc, you can do Coqui Aperitivo, or you could do uh, this stuff called Kina Liero Dior, which is like a modern recreation of Kina Lille. I'm gonna be using Tanqueray. Some people are going to take offense to that if they're real Bondians, because he requests specifically Gordon's gin. I'm fresh out of Gordon's gin, tough. Um, at the time, I think Gordon's was a higher proof. That's why it was supposed to be Gordon's. I don't think they make that bottle anymore, so it's kind of a moot point. We're gonna go three ounces of London Dry Gin from my James Bond sized 1.75 handle of gin. Because Bond likes to drink. He's kind of got a problem. And one of those problems is murdering people. He's got a license to kill. And he likes to use it. One ounce of vodka, half an ounce of Pina Lille, or in our case, Lille Blanc. This is essentially a variety of vermouth, and if you don't refrigerate it, it will oxidize. Typically, a drink like this would be stirred. You'll sometimes hear people say, oh, he's making it the wrong way. The thing about James Bond is he doesn't care. And pour that. And now we have to garnish it with a lemon twist, a wide strip of lemon. And this is a thing I very much approve because I do think that martinis are better when they're lemony and rather than salty. I don't like those salty, briny martinis. Bond. James Bond. You know, it's funny. I've hated that drink so many times, but today it is kind of clicking for me. It's got such a brightness to it. It's very citrusy. And uh, maybe I, I'm just in the right place. You know, my palate's just right today to enjoy it. It's, it's a surprisingly mellow drink. The gin is very present, but moderated. A gin martini can be pretty overpowering. This one isn't. The lemon is probably the most dominant flavor here, which makes it light, bright, and lemony. And obviously, extremely sophisticated looking. You know, there's nothing better than a piece of stemware with crystal clear, ice cold liquid in it and a, a lemon peel perched on it. The Lille has got just a touch of sweetness that shows up here, which rounds out the drink pretty nicely. Maybe it's just because I've been sipping this Earl Grey tea and the two must complement each other very well because I've hated that drink so many times and today it's working out great for me. You know, life's like that. Sometimes you don't like something, you gotta go back and try it again. I just wanted to let you know what's happening on the podcast. That's Midnight Local, me and Meredith's podcast where we mostly talk about movies. This week, we're talking about Tim Burton's 1989 Batman. It's one of my favorite episodes. It's one of my favorite films. I think this is a really good episode if you just wanna check out the podcast. I'm gonna put a link in the pin comment and put it up here in the corner. Let me know, did I make a good case for why Jack Nicholson is the scariest version of the Joker? I understand you all have your own opinions about the Joker, but I do think that Jack's, I think he's the scariest Joker. Please check out Midnight Local. Meredith and I are super excited about what we're doing over there on that. And you can check it out on YouTube right now. Back to how to drink. The Big Lebowski came out in 1998. Of course, this drink was well known before then, but I really do think that the dude Lebowski man really did propel this drink into icon status. You know, this is an iconic drink. Anytime anybody makes a cocktail book of drinks of the movies, this one's gonna show up in it. It's a stupid, simple drink to make. Equal parts, Kahlua, vodka, and milk. I've made it on the show several times, but truth be told, 
Although they're not terribly sophisticated, they are terribly delicious if you're in the mood for such a thing. When you want a white Russian, they can be a great joy. A little desserty. You should try to pour that slowly across it so that it sort of clouds up and hangs out, and then you kind of stir it in. That's the idea. Does he make them without ice in the movie? I feel like that's something he would do. But. He makes them throughout the movie, so if he doesn't have ice, yes. And stir, <laughs> stirring it with your finger, as the dude does, is, I think, acceptable. Well, here's to you, man. You fucking human paraquat. Oh, yeah, delish. It is a milkshake. It's a, it's a coffee milkshake. You know, it's, it's one of the first drinks I ever made when I was a young man. I don't know, there's not much more to say about a white Russian, you know, it's, that's what it is. It's a tasty drink, it's three equal parts, you can't really mess it up. I did a whole episode of elevated versions of the white Russian. Uh, I think it's worth checking out, there's some really fun drinks in there. I'm gonna put a link in the pinned comment and up here in the corner. Uh, take a look, you might enjoy that, you, you probably will enjoy that. I have to wear a bathrobe in it, for example. Um, <laughs> that was a good episode. Yeah, that was fun. Our next most famous drink on this beautiful magazine-style listicle is the Cosmo. The funny thing to me about this is the Cosmo is a drink that got this reputation as being kind of the drink of basic bitches. Right? Like, is that fair? I think it's because of Sex and the City. Right, that's my point. Yeah, that's what yeah, Sex and the City right. did to the drink. It had been invented by King Cocktail himself, Dale DeGroff, at the Rainbow Room, which even in high school, uh, like, my dream was to go out for dinner at the Rainbow Room because I was a weird kid. I was like, they have a full fucking orchestra. People, like, actually swing dance. The swing dancing revival <laughs> was all happening. It's at the top of Rockefeller yeah. Center. Like, that place seems awesome, and it, it probably was awesome. So the Cosmopolitan was him taking everything that he knew about classic mixology and pre-prohibition drinks and making it palatable to the bargoing crowd that he was catering to in the 1990s and, and kind of trying to restore something that had been lost in the 80s. Because, you know, if you watch the movie Cocktail, you'll see a lot of questionable drinks. It's funny to me that the Cosmo got this reputation kind of of being the exact opposite, like of a skinny girl margarita kind of thing or something, you know? All right, so to start with, we're going to need absolute citron. I understand, if I'm not mistaken, that that was like, we have a lot of this lying around, invent a drink for it. So an ounce and a half of absolute citron. I need a half an ounce of triple sec, and if you're looking for your top shelf triple sec, that means Cointreau, usually. Grand Marnier is more of a suitable replacement for Curacao. Triple sec is a little more tart. We're gonna need an ounce of cranberry juice. Oh, spilt it everywhere. This is like a funky bottle to pour from. Okay, yeah, that's the really tart, unsweetened variety. Anyway, we need a quarter ounce of lime juice. Wow. <laughs> and then we're gonna strain that. Bright pink. Your cranberry juice is going to affect this color. This is bright red or pink, depending on how the camera decides to make it look today. And this was the kicker. This is probably something that I don't think too many people had seen a bartender do in 1997 or six or five when Dale DeGroff unleashed this drink upon the world, which is that it gets garnished with a flamed orange peel. It's also something I don't recall them ever displaying on the show, but I also didn't really like watch the show, watch the show, so what do I know? Yeah, I doubt it. Well, this is a Cosmo, and uh, my garnish is actually quite nice looking today, so I'm proud of it. Here we go, one of the more famous drinks, I think. Very famous, a super famous drink. It's top famous. And they're refreshing. Very, very bright. Very, 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 very refreshing. The only problem with this one is, I'm gonna bet DeGroff was using like ocean spray cranberry juice because that's what you get, right? Ocean spray cranberry juice is a lot sweeter than that stuff I was using. So this one is bone dry, delicious bone dry. And I don't know that this is what he was serving at the Rainbow Room, to be perfectly blunt. I think two bar spoons of simple are gonna help this. No, I'm not gonna touch it. It's bone dry, but it's it's growing on me. You get a lot of col color in this. You get the tartness, you get the lemon from the citron. You get a very nice orange note from the twist at the end there. It's good, it's good. I could imagine it being served a little sweeter than this. And I would bet that once the drink migrated out of New York City, it absolutely was. But I'm gonna say this is probably the, as close to the New York version as you can get. You see recipes with grenadine and all sorts of things. 
I don't know how old the audience I'm talking to is here, Meredith, but whether they know it or not, this is a very, very famous movie. It's one of the uh, most beloved films of all time, Casablanca. The most beautiful, tragic of love stories. And also, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Wait, wait, before you move on, you're talking to people who are predominantly... Oh, is my demo? 44.7%, 25 to 34. That's a big demo. 25 to 34 is like, that's separate groups of people. That's not one group. And then split pretty much 2020 between 18 and 24 and 35 and 44. Okay. Well, let me tell you kids something. Get out there and watch Casablanca, okay? It's a good movie for date night. It's black and white. I know. You can manage. It's fine. I hear that sometimes from younger people, like on TikTok. And like people who are too old to be saying this. People in their early 20s and late teens saying, there's too many color movies. Why would I waste time on black and white ones? <laughs> oh, it like hurts my brain, man. All right, so a French 75, it's essentially a Tom Collins where you replace the soda for champagne, okay? There's basically two ways to serve this though. You can lean into its Collinsiness, where you serve it in a Collins glass and you just carbonate it with champagne instead of soda water. Or you can lean into its champagniness and think of it as the gin that stiffens up your champagne in a champagne cocktail. I've always done them as a Collins, but tonight, feeling rather classy and I think true to Casablanca's form, we're gonna put it in a coupe. But yeah, French 75s are the drink of choice in the film where Rick Blaine runs his casino, his bar. Right. This Rick's is a place. drink that looks innocent and cute, but man, will they sneak up on you. Well, that's why they're called French 75s. They are named for the 75 millimeter artillery that the French skillfully used to pound the Germans in World War One. In other words, they pack a wallet. Here we go. Two ounces of our London dry gin. Heading in to the breach once more, my friend. We're gonna need one ounce of lemon. All right, three quarters of an ounce of simple. And of course, as always in these kinds of drinks, simple to taste. It's such a sweetener. You can sweeten it as much or as little as you want. Okay, we're gonna shake that up. So now I'm gonna strain this into my coupe. Oh, I have this tiny little beer bottle of cheap California champagne, which is definitely what they were drinking at Rick's place, but also, I don't need to open a whole bottle of champagne every time I want to make a, whoops, single drink. Uh, we just top it up with champagne. And as long as we're presenting it this way, I would strongly endorse dressing it up with a twist. Well, as I am legally obligated to say, he was looking at you, kid. Mm. And that's why they're so dangerous because they are so easy to drink. That might be the best goddamn French 75 I've had in a long time. Although I can't remember the last time I had a French 75. My wife and I kind of banned them because for the same reason, it was just like, man, I'm getting fucked up and yep. bad headache on these. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> they are, they're a little bit sweet. They're on the sweeter end of the spectrum, like any Collins would be. Super stupid drinkable. They're not, like, a lot of people don't love gin. These are not super ginny at all. If anything, they just taste like sparkly lemonades. <laughs> yep. It's like, if you go to a wedding and the French 75 is one of the signature cocktails, like, you're in for a night. That might be true, yeah. I never thought about that. Anyway, so this drink is uh, really famous, not from media or movies or anything like that. It's a drink that was made famous by a real person in the real world, uh, a guy named Ernest Hemingway. Maybe you've heard of him. It's a drink called the Hemingway Daiquiri. It was frequently referred to euphemistically though as a Papa Doble because of his tendency to always order them as a double. Now the mythology behind this drink is that Hemingway had diabetes and that he wanted something that was less sugared than a standard daiquiri. Not only does that not work out when you look at the recipe, like, oh, it's, yeah, that's still sweet. I also don't think it works out historically. I don't think that that's anything to do with the history here with this drink at all. But we're gonna shake one up all the same. I'm gonna need a couple of limes. Doing my patented bear slice. <laughs> patented, patent pending. In order to make this thing a double, I need one and a half ounces of lime juice. And we are making the double, the Papa Double, the Papa Doble. He would get these at the La Floridita bar down in Havana, where he spent a lot of time. Next you need some grapefruit juice. Quarter ounce for a single, half an ounce for a double. 
Here is the tricky thing. So the thing about this drink and all drinks from this time frame that call for grapefruit juice that you have to think about is that almost every grapefruit you find, at least where I live anymore, are these red grapefruits. These did not exist to the extent that I am aware before the 90s. They're some kind of a hybrid. The grapefruits that would have been present in Hemingway's time, or prevalent I should say, would have been really bitter. White grapefruits, very, very tart. Not that you can't find those now, but I, they're very unusual to see those in the grocery store, in my opinion. We're gonna do half an ounce, because we're making a papadobu. Otherwise, it would be a quarter. The papadobu. Papa, papa, papadobu. Now we need a half an ounce of maraschino liqueur. Basically, he's just splitting the simple syrup between maraschino liqueur and grapefruit juice and also balancing it deeply in favor of rum, for which we're going to use this Hamilton 87 White Stash Rum. And I will need three ounces for my Papa, Papa, Papa Doble. You get what I'm doing there, Mary? You get it? Paparazzi? Yeah, I'm doing a little paparazzi joke. You are? Okay. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it seems more like a me thing to do. But sh do you know, is his house in Key West, your Key West guy, is it owned by someone or is it a tourist attraction? Oh, it's an attraction. I mean, it's owned by somebody or something like that, but you can visit it. Beautiful house. I drove by it once. Lots of cats, but it is kind of neat to visit. I mean, like here's where the, the where he wrote and this is the weird furniture that he collected and here is the urinal that he brought home one day from the bar. You can see <laughs> the penny that he cemented to the bottom of the pool. And uh, this gigantic glass that I'm using feels really appropriate for our Papa Doble. That's what they called Hemingway. That was his nickname at one point in his life was Papa. Apparently everybody called him Papa. A little weird, a little weird. I don't know. Imagine going down the street and just everybody you meet waving and saying, hi, you daddy. <laughs> in Key West, there's an annual Hemingway lookalike contest. The winners every year are unbelievable, spot on. And yeah. usually wearing a cable knit turtleneck sweater in Key West in July. I don't know how they do that. I just think that's insane. But uh, anyway, here is to uh, a movable feast. Whew. Dry, so dry. It's a very dry cocktail. I love it. I don't need a double. A single would be fine for me. I like these a lot. A bar spoon of sweetness would probably make it a lot more accessible. Two bar spoons. It's barely recognizable as a daiquiri if you are expecting a daiquiri. Let's put it that way. It is grapefruit, it is bitter, it is cold and bracing. It's a very fresh drink. It's definitely a drink for a person who wants to have quite a few tonight, and they're not looking to get all that sugar, you know, pumping in their head. That happens to me. I get this, like, headache, my ears start throbbing, I hear the woof, woof, woof. It's from all the sugar I drink out here. You definitely get the maraschino. That comes right out. It punches right through the rest of that flavor profile. It's a very well-balanced drink. All of the components of this drink are working very well together and holding their own. If there's one on the menu and you don't know what to order, it's a safe bet. It's a good drink, you know? Not only does it imply that like, boy, the people who are running this bar know their shit, then, you know, they're, they're pretty tough to mess up. The only real variable is, well, how sweet is it gonna be? His recipe calls for, as far as I'm aware, a unaged Havana club, or it would have been actually Cuban Bacardi. I think I would like a little bit more of a little, a few years on that rum, and maybe a mellower, a mellow Jamaican or something like that. Or I could see like an El Dorado five year being really good in there. One more drink to get through on this non-definitive list of famous drinks, by the way, I wanna point out, because I'm reserving the right to do this episode another time. Because there's definitely some other famous drinks we could be doing. Put an ice cube in your glass. Full points if you can guess what I'm making. No, there's nothing to guess. We're doing sweet vermouth on the rocks. A drink that shows up in a pretty pivotal moment in Groundhog Day, a movie that a lot of people have very strong feelings about. Uh, sweet vermouth, rocks with a twist, please. For you, miss? The same. That's my favorite drink. Mine too. Get some uh, sweet vermouth in your glass, which may not be a thing that you ever think to drink, but I'm telling you, it can be very nice as long as it's good vermouth and it is not oxidized. You know, you've kept it in the fridge, that kind of thing. And then we do a twist of orange. I think a twist of lemon would be good too, but in the film, it's a twist of orange. And uh, here we go to uh, doing the same thing every day forever. Bananas. In the mm. Dol today I'm getting a lot of bananas between the orange and the Dolan. Bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S, bananas. At first when you said bananas, I thought you were gonna say like 
this drink's it's so crazy. Good. It's bananas. Yeah. So I was like, That's no, such a it weird tastes reaction. like bananas. <laughs> I'm getting very strong banana notes today. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Very tasty. Well, guys, thank you all so much for hanging out with us. We took a look at like just the famous drinks, just drinks right off the top of my head that seemed pretty famous. Let's just try that. Let's just see if that was cool. We'll do the famousy stuff. We're just gonna be uh, star fuckers today on how to drink. You know, we do have a Patreon, and if you wanted to support the show and you want some extras, there's like extras that go with every episode. Uh, we're getting good at that. Uh, pins, all kinds of things that go on over there. We have a private Discord just for patrons. Uh, why don't you check it out? There'll be a link in the pin comment below and up here. I'm also on all the social media spots that you would expect to find me. Twitch, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Patreon, and, uh, and I'll see you guys soon with another episode of How to Drink. Uh, until then, this has been the show. Oh, hey, look at these. There's a bunch of things you should click on appearing around my head. Isn't that neat? Look at that. Oh, wow. Yeah, one of these is probably our podcast. You should totally check out the podcast. That's a good one.